Today we're going to review the principles of Laplace transform. So this lecture is a bit complicated. I require your full attention. And if the concepts that are not uh, are going to be presented here are not clear, then come talk to me during office hours or send me an email, uh, and we can go over them again. I posted a short link, a video um, in Brightspace that you can watch. It's 13 minutes long and uh, contains the main message that you're going to see in this lecture. So if you had the chance to, to watch it, great. This lecture will make a lot more sense. Uh, if you haven't, then after we are done, take a look at it. I also posted a table of Laplace transforms that we're going to use from now on in the course. And this lecture and lecture five will be all you need for the assignment that I'm going to post this week, maybe tomorrow. But you do still need lecture five to be able to complete it. In lecture five, you're going to see that on Thursday. So as soon as the assignment comes out, there are already a few questions that you can start working on. Okay, so should post it, be able to post it today or tomorrow latest. And I will make an announcement with more instructions. Um, then, okay. So my goal today is to go over Laplace transform. My intention, though, is not to teach you how to do Laplace transform, but is to teach you what a Laplace transform represents and why we need it when you want to control a system. I was informed, though, that some of you did not or have not haven't taken um, Laplace transforms in differential equation. I haven't seen that before which is uh, potentially the case. If that is the case, and again, these things are not clear, then I'm, I can create a short manual and upload that to, to um, Brightspace as well. And again, if these things are not clear, just contact to me and you can go over these concepts again during office hours or outside of office hours if need. So in this lecture, we are going to review the principle of Laplace transforms and, sorry, my video is not updating. One second. Okay, let me start this over. Just give me one second. Okay, so by the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the, the principles of Laplace transform and then be able to apply it to a given system. When first thing that you can ask is why do we care about Laplace transforms? Well, a Laplace transform is simply a way to solve for a differential equation. And when you're able to solve for a differential equation, using the models that we described before, we can now relate the input and the output of those systems back to the artery model that we uh, modeled in one of our lectures. Having the model and now having a solution to that model will allow us to give this model any input and watch how the output behaves. For example, we can investigate how the uh, fluid flow in a given branch evolves as a function of the input pressure. And for all systems that we derived so far, they are all governed by the, by the same or similar sets of differential equations. So if you want to study them further, we need to solve them. We could solve these equations uh, by hand using a conventional method, but that would be fairly complicated when you switch the input. If you switch the input, we have to redo all the process. Using, the, using Laplace transform, we can create a simple equation that you're going to call later a transfer function. And that transfer function behaves like a block where you give it an input, we pass that through the transfer function and you get the output. And for any linear input, we can now calculate the output based on that same transfer function, which is the Laplace representation of the model or the equations that model the system. So the, from now on, once you're able to calculate that is that representation of the system, that's your going, what you're going to use uh, for the rest of the course. Here is one example. We model a mass spring damper system before, and the, we came up with the following equation here. 
So this equation relates the input, the system, which in this case is a force and the output, which in this case is a displacement. If we now want to calculate what you can call here the temporal response or the time response of the system, that's the same thing, for a given force, how do we do that? Well, we need to define how the force is in the time domain. If it's a sinusoidal waveform, if it's a step, the input, and so on, apply that to the system and then solve that differential equation, solve for x. If we change the input, we need to repeat the process. So we can do that using simple um, differential equation tools, or we can use the Laplace transform. And if you go with the Laplace transform, then this equation can be represented in the Laplace domain, which you're going to see later. And this works for any input the system may have. That it has all the information about the system. We put an input, we get an output. And if you change the input, everything still works. We still get the output that corresponds to that input. So that makes this makes the analysis a lot easier. So how are we going to approach this? So there are three main steps. If you want to solve for a differential equation uh, using the Laplace transform, first, of course, we need to create that differential equation. That is, we need to model a system and get the, the equations that describe the behavior of that system. Here are the equations for the mass spring damper system. We'll then apply the Laplace transform to this system and we'll create a different equation that is now in, given in the frequency or Laplace domain. You notice here that all the derivatives disappeared and they were replaced by S. We're going to see what S represents later. But now the derivatives are gone. So this makes our uh, solving for this a lot easier than with the, the derivatives that we had before or integrals. And the third step then is to do the inverse problem and go back to the time domain, but now solving for the variable of interest, which in this case would be x of t, the displacement of that mass, for example. And this is, this is one possible solution to the problem when the input is a sinusoidal waveform. So these are the three main steps. We have already addressed step one. We are able to model electromechanical systems. And you're now going to look at the steps two and three. So let's go back then to our mass spring damper system. And let's just drop the damper just to make things that are a little easier. So here we have the governing equation of that system. Displacement is x, f of t is the input. You see that this is a second order differential equation. The displacement depends on its own second derivative. That's the differential equation. According to uh, some of you learned in differential equations, what are the possible solutions to x of t that will satisfy equation one? What are the, there are only two possible formats for x of t. Well, they are, they are listed here. So the first one is that x of t will be a exponential function. And if it is the case, we can write the solution of x of t as follows. x of t equals exponential to of negative sigma t, where sigma is a real constant and t is time. So this now gives one possible solution as exponential waveforms that will now increase in time or decrease in time depending on the value of sigma, a, con a real constant. The solutions can also be sinusoidal. And if that is sinusoidal, we can write x of t as sine of omega t plus j cosine of omega t, a sine and cosine waveforms, and a complex variable now just shifted in time. And if we want to use the same representation as the exponential we did before, we could say that this is equal to, this is Euler's, theorem that that a function can be described as the exponential of negative j omega t j is a complex variable and omega is the frequency of the sinusoidal waveform so this expands again if we apply the formula as sine of omega t plus j the complex variable cosine of omega t right but it's still a sinusoidal waveform 
Right? So this is the same, basically the same representation. And the third poss possibility is that we have a combination of both exponential and sinusoidal waveforms. In that case, we can simply multiply them. We can multiply the exponential and the sinusoidal, multiply exponential of negative j omega t, the sinusoidal waveform, by a uh, or with a real component here with a exponential component, exponential negative sigma t. And now we have different formats. We can have only sinusoidal, only exponential, or you can have a sinusoidal that decays over time, depending on how we select j, uh, sorry, how we select omega and sigma. If, if omega is zero, then you go back to a pur purely exponential waveform. If, if uh, sigma is zero, to a purely sinusoidal waveform. If sigma and omega are not zero, then you have an exponent uh, sinusoidal that decays over time or increases over time as it goes up. So these are the possible solutions to this differential equation. Why are these the only possible solutions? Any, any ideas? Why is only the exponential and the sinusoidal waveform that I can solve this differential equation? Why these two functions in particular? Does anybody know? No? Any any guesses? Is Euler's um whatever it is variable? Um and the sinusoid, is it like best does do they best represent like natural situations, like real life situations? Right. That that's one uh they, they do represent natural situations, they, they account for all that is spectrum, but mathematically there is a simple explanation, a simpler explanation to that. And mathematically, we can see that the derivative of the exponential, let's say exponential of negative sigma t dt, what is the, the result here? Is negative sigma, exponential of negative sigma t. Is it still an exponential waveform, but it's a scaled version of itself. It doesn't change shape. What is the derivative of sine of omega t? What is the derivative of the sine of omega t? Omega cosine of omega t. Very good. Omega cosine of omega t. Same thing. It's a still a sinusoidal waveform. It's scaled, and now it becomes a cosine, so it has a time shift. But the shape doesn't change. So these are the only two functions that when we take the derivative of them, and the derivative of the derivative, and so on, the shape, is it still the same? The function doesn't change. Is it still the same function? But it's a scaled version of itself. And that's why they are the only ones that will meet uh, or will create solutions to equation one. So how are we going to do this? Now we're going to go from a, a time domain to a what you're going to call now a frequency domain. And the frequency domain is basically a decomposition of that the signal of interest in terms of its exponential and its sinusoidal waveforms. Right? If you get these equations from a real model, we know that uh, the solutions, the displacement of a mass, the pressure in the artery or the um, fluid flow, the, the mathematical formulation for them will fall in one of these three categories. Now, we're going to create a separate domain they're gonna call the Laplace domain where we are going to represent this system in terms of their components that will make up that signal uh, in terms of the exponential and its own sinusoidal waveform. So we don't really care anymore about time responses, but we care about the fundamental components of that signal in terms of sinusoidal and exponential wave or waveforms. What is the required sinusoidal waveform? What is the required exponential waveform that will make that signal Exactly. All right, so this is what we're going to do now. We take our signal. We're going to multiply that signal by an exponential, by a sinusoidal, and we're going to transform that into what we're going to call the frequency domain or a complex domain. That will decompose the signal into um, sinusoidal and exponential waveforms. So here, when you look at the mathematical definition of the Laplace transform, this is what we see. Sorry. We see this big integral, which is a function of 
sigma and omega, integral from negative infinity to infinity of a signal times an exponential waveform times a sinusoidal waveform. Now we can combine these and write as follows and just combine both exponentials there negative sigma, negative j omega, all times t. And we can call this part of the integral here s. And s is then sigma plus j omega, which simplifies our exp uh, equation to this. Integral of negative infinity to infinity of x of t times exponential of negative st. s again, negative sigma, or positive sigma, plus j omega. So let's analyze this definition. This is the mathematical definition. Let's try to make sense of it. We are taking our signal. We're multiplying that signal with a sinusoidal and an exponential waveform, and you're taking the integral. What is that? The multiplication and the integral is simply a mathematical trick that we are using to compare two signals. We are going to compare our original signal x of t with different signals that you are going to create by changing sigma and omega. We multiply them together and we take the integral to see how close they are. And if, if this integral is indeed a measure of how close the systems are, we'll get to a point where we'll find out what, what is the omega, what is the sigma we need to make that signal exactly. So let me give you an example. I'm going to go a bit off script here. Let me use the whiteboard, whiteboard instead. But you can annotate what we're going to talk about here on slides. So just give me one second. So let's assume that we have that a signal x of t. This is the signal x of t. And what is x of t? Is the solution to a differential equation? Is the displacement of the mass for a step input, for example? Is the charge in a magnetic circuit, in an electrical circuit, for a step voltage? Something like that. We want to find what is the sigma, what is the omega that we need to create the signal. Why sigma and omega? Because we know that if this is the solution to a differential equation, then x of t can only be exponential or sinusoidal. Or it can be a combination of them, exponential of negative sigma t, exponential negative j omega t, which gives exponential of negative sigma plus omega t, oh, sorry, omega j times t. These are the only possible solutions to this differential equation. OK, our job now is to find omega and to find sigma that will recreate x of t precisely. So now, how are we going to do that? We can create a plane here. And let's put on this plane the values of omega and sigma. So let's call this one here omega. And let's call this sigma. And let's pick a point. Let's pick a point in this graph. Let's say this point right here. This point is called as sigma a. And with sigma, uh, sigma sigma a, omega a, so let me just call that just point a to avoid confusion. So this is point a. And when you take point a, we create a signal. Let's call the signal x a, which is the exponential of negative sigma a plus omega a j t, right? Because by specifying point a, we specify the value sigma a and the value omega a. And this gives us a signal. Now this signal will be, will have its own shape that will all depend on sigma a and omega a. Okay, what do we do with that now? Well, now that's when that integration comes in. To see how close this signal and this signal are, we can take the integral of their multiplication and multiply x of t with the one we created here, x a of t dt, 
from negative infinity to infinity. How does this comparison work? Let's recreate the signal here. This is the signal we had, x of t. And the signal that we created here, I don't know what it is. Let's assume that it's something like this. This is x a of t. And let's create some an axis here. This is the magnitude. And this would be the time. All right, so all, all good so far. So this is x of a that we created by picking this point, a random combination of sigma and omega. This is x of t, our original signal. All good so far? Yeah? Okay, so silence means confusion or perfect understanding. What is it? Which one is it? Looks, looks good to me. I've never heard of a Laplace transform before, so I'm a little lost, but I think I just need to learn the basic math behind it. Okay, so let, let's go slowly through this. And uh, if later it doesn't make sense, I can reenter it. So now we want to compare these two signals. How close are they? That's why you're multiplying and taking integral, and I'll tell you why. When you multiply this, what do you have? This portion here, we have a positive and a positive value, so we have a positive number passing here one is positive one is negative now we have a negative number here we have negative negative it's negative and so on All right so parts of this graph are positive parts of this graph are negative when x a and x of t have the same size sign then you have positive when they don't have the same sign we have a negative number so this is the result of this multiplication and now you take the integral what does it mean to take the integral it takes this area plus this area plus that area. The integral now gives us this sum of this area. Okay. And what do we do with it? Well, let's call this result x of s. And let's give this graph a third dimension. Let's call this x of s. And let's take the result of this integration, which is simply a metric of how close these two signals are. And let's plot that magnitude here, let's assume that the magnitude is a finite magnitude and it's there. Okay, so these signals don't quite match. We'll get a number here that tells us how close they are. Now well, let's pick another point. Let's pick another point and let's take a point, a point around here. And let's call this point B. If you pick that point B, we are creating X of B, which is exponential of negative sigma B plus omega B J all times T. And let's further assume that now we, for some reason, by luck, we got exactly uh, sigma B and omega B that we need to recreate our signal, original signal X of T that I'm going to attempt to create here. So this is still x of t. And the signal we just created is exactly that. We got lucky. That's exactly the same signal. And let's create again the axis. So now let's think about it. When you took the multiplication and you take the integral, let's see if you are following. Would the result be greater or smaller than what we saw here? It would be smaller. Why would that be smaller? Because there's less differences between the two functions. Okay, you're getting that. So there is less difference between the two functions. Very good. And that's the key point. If there is less difference between the two, when you multiply them, they are, it's the same. So you're basically taking x and squaring x, right? Because it's the same function is x basically times x, it's x is squared, everything is positive. Now let me ask you the question again. Now the integral here, would it be greater or smaller than the integral in the first case? Um, greater. Greater, why would that be greater? Because we don't have the um, parts in the minus um, huh. section huh. anymore. Exactly, because everything is positive. These parts that we are taking out of the sum don't exist anymore. And that's because exactly 
what uh, was just said, because these signals are matching, they are precisely the same, there's less difference between them. When you now take this integration, this integration cannot be any higher than, this is the maximum value, because it's the only point when the signals match and we have always a positive number. So this means that on our graph here, this must be the highest point in the curve. And this will tend to a very large number. And it'll be the highest point that will tell us where exactly these uh, two signals match. So what do we do with this one, this point A? This point A is meaningless. It doesn't really help us with anything. We just say, okay, we got an approximation. It's a fine approximation, not very good. When you look at the magnitude of point B, it will be the highest. So now we can say with confidence that this is the sigma, this is the omega we need to recreate the or the solution. We now know the frequency of our solution. We now know the exponential component of our solution. Okay. So what is what is the purpose of creating the two separate equations, x a and x b? Is that just for like get, guessing wrong versus guessing right type situation? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Uh, when we do manually the Laplace transform, this will be accounted for in one step because we are taking the integral here from yeah. negative infinity to infinity. So the entire 2D plane is done in one step, right? right? So we don't need to worry about this. Somebody has calculated all this for us and that was Laplace, right? So we can, all we need to do is use this table, but we are, we are halfway through. So let's analyze another key point here that uh, I'm going to take, and this is the point I want to look at, where both omega is zero and sigma is zero. Let's call this point C. Sorry, can what I ask a question be... yes. before that? Um, so just to make it clear, the reason why the second, um, like uh, the signal, the um, integral for signals of point B and our actual signal is positive is because uh, when they're both positive, uh, they give us a positive um, value. And when they're both negative, when we multiply the, uh, the two, they still give us a positive value. So it's positive all the way. Right, Thank so you. Us, yes. So, so if when the signals are the same, we have positive, when the signals are not the same, we have negative, which will happen here, positive and negative because the signals do not match. When they match, they always have the same side throughout the time axis. So it's always positive. Got it, thanks. Uh, professor, could you please yes. uh, explain again, because I'm still confused that why the, they are negative when they are different and when they are the same, they are the positive. Well, if you have a signal here that uh, up to, let's take this signal, up to this point, both signals are positive. When you multiply positive and a positive number, we have a positive value. Oh, oh I got this it. Point, I got yeah, it. Thank from you. From here to whereabouts? To here, uh, this region here, we have a positive and a negative. The result is negative. Yeah, yeah All I right, think so I got it. Thank you. Okay, so last point here is omega equals to zero, sigma equals to zero. What is x uh, of c? What is x of c? Uh, one. One, very good, one. So if x is one, what are we doing? We are taking the signal, the original signal, and they're just integrating it by itself. We have our signal, x of t. Uh, how did I draw? Like that. And you're just take it, taking, it, taking its own integral. If it is a sinusoidal decaying over time, we are taking this area plus this area plus that area plus that area. What is the result of the integration? Zero. Now, if you take the integral of a cosine wave form, we have positive and negative areas that are always the same. The result will be zero. So in this particular case, I'm making the assumption that uh, this will indeed result in zero because you're taking all these areas. So this is another point of interest where this integration here, this solution will tend to zero. The magnitude will tend to zero. So you have two points to watch for. 
points where the magnitude tends to infinity because we matched the signal perfectly, points where the integration tends to zero. Yeah, here it is. In the case of a cosine, for example, take the integral of a cosine waveform, the integral is zero. Or a cosine that decays over time, a perfectly cosine waveform that decays over time, something like this. Something that like that waveform up there. If that decays over time and is like an exponential n sinusoidal, this area plus this area plus that plus that plus that, it will be exactly zero. Right. So these are the two points of interest, points that go to infinity, points where it goes to zero. The everything else on this plane is, is meaningless. We don't really need it. So we can now populate the entire plane with all points and you will see spikes, stuff like that going on. So we only care about these points where it goes to zero. Very well. Now we decompose the system into this format, combinations of sigma and omega, or uh, if we call sigma plus omega j equals to s, uh, we can have an exponential of a negative st. And s is the Laplace variable. We can now replace our x of a here with the definition of the Laplace transform which is the signal times exponential of negative sigma t, sorry, negative st, negative st. So we converted our function from a time function into a function that is now a combination of exponential and sinusoidal waveforms into the Laplace domain. Time doesn't matter anymore. All we care about is which signals we need to uh, make that signal, recreate that signal. So now let's take this one step further and let, let's try to, instead of having a graph here, have a equation that it will show the same behavior as we see in the graph, but now as a function of S, as a function of sigma plus J omega. What basically my question is, if you want to rewrite this equation as a function of s to see exactly what we see in this graph, what are the what what is that function? So let's think about it. We need we need two points. We need this function to go to infinity, and you need this function to go to zero when we approach zero and when we approach sigma a and omega a. Let's call this function f x of s. And the first thing is easy. Well, we need our function to go to zero when s tends to zero. What is s again? S is sigma plus omega j. So when s tends to zero, sigma tends to zero, omega tends to zero, our function goes to zero. So it would be intuitive to just say that our function can be s. When s tends to zero, x of s tends to zero. You end with exactly what you see here. But we also need our function to go to infinity when we approach point A. Let's call that S A or sigma A and omega A. When you approach that point, the function must go. Uh, sorry, there was not sigma A, it was point B. Excuse me, it was point B. When you approach sigma B and omega B, the function must go to infinity. How do we make this go to infinity when you approach that point? Any, any guesses how to compose that function? I think it should be a linear function of s. So I think we need to write s times b or either s times something plus b. We are getting there. Very good. But what if we divide it by that? What if we divide it by it? Here we made this go to zero and s tends to zero. If we divide the function by s minus that point, which is sigma a plus j a when we tend to when s tends to sigma a plus j a this tends to zero and the whole thing goes to infinity the whole thing goes to infinity okay so if you now scan this map here 
with the values of sigma and omega we input in this function, we shall see the exact same thing. When s tends to zero, we go to zero. When s here is tending to this value, b, I keep writing a. It should be b again. It is confusing. It should be point b. This is the point where it tended to infinity. Right? So when s tends to this value, then the denominator here gives zero because s will be equal to this. So that minus that is zero. And then the function tends to infinity. It's precisely what we have. Okay. And this is now the Laplace transform of X of T. It's as simple as that. This is the Laplace transform of X of T. And if you want to find X of T, we need to now go back and to do the inverse Laplace transform. So if I'm you understanding this, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Okay. If I'm understanding this correctly, X, this S at, sorry, S over S minus Sigma B plus J, all that, that's accounting for the zero case and the infinity case? Right. Okay. Right. Correct. So the zero case, we are going to call those points the zeros of the function. The infinity cases, we call them the poles of that function. So these are the two points of interest that we need to account for here. One thing to note, though, is when we select a, uh, a, a complex variable like b here, we have uh, j. We also uh, j omega. We also have negative j omega because these are always complex conjugate numbers. So if you have plus j omega, we have negative j omega. So they will always come in pairs. So here we have a second component. It will be s minus sigma b minus j omega b uh, because we cannot only when you have a complex number we can we always have pairs of them and right? they are always coming in pairs if you have s equals to negative uh, say uh, sigma plus j omega the complex conjugate of that is sigma minus j omega if you have one you must have the other one all right so if you have one peak for this one you must have another peak, peak for them, right? And both are accounted for. Okay, so this is the Laplace transform of that sigma. And if you want to, so, so this operation is already tabled for us. If you look at the Laplace transform of a step function, there is a table that tells us what is the exact representation in the frequency domain. If you want to know the Laplace transform of a cosine of omega t, for example, we can look at the table of Laplace transform because this entire analysis has been done for us. So we know the forward Laplace transform from time to frequency domain, and we know the inverse Laplace transform as well, based on all these analysis that um, uh, is already done and tabled. So this table is posted. Here it is, it's posted uh, on uh, Brightspace. These are all the functions that you can, we, we are going to use that we have taken the Laplace transform of. Okay. And we're going to walk or uh, use this table uh, throughout the term. Any, any questions here? Any questions so far? Excuse me, Professor. Yes. Um, are you going to solve like proper examples? Because yes. like I don't really understand this very well, but I think if you use like actual examples, I would. No, of course, yes, I'm gonna use some examples, but uh, what I really wanted to take from this is that what it represents. Now we're going to see how to use them for sure. But the first step is to uh, understand exactly why we are doing this and what it represents. So there is this lecture and the next lecture, we're going to use Laplace transforms. We're gonna indeed do some examples. Uh, professor, so yeah. this equation are uh, including the, like the point C situation, the point B situation. It also includes the A point situation? No, no. 
it does not need to include the a point situation. Well, it, it, it does indirectly because a point is is uh, has no particular in useful information for us. That's why we just neglected it. But when you have that equation written, and if you plug in point A to that equation, it will give you the exact magnitude that you're supposed to see at point B. Okay. So we built the entire system only with poles and zeros, and everything else okay. will match. Okay, thank you. All right. So I know that this is a bit, this is a lot to take here. It's a lot of information. So I'll let you guys um, watch that video I posted if this is not clear. But let's do a few examples to try to clarify that. So here's one. So let's assume we have this Laplace transform. This is the graph we obtained from taking the Laplace transform. What do we see here? We see two peaks and you see one zero, two poles and one zero. What is the signal we are dealing with? What is the Laplace transform? Here. We have a point here where this point. This point here, which is about, uh, I would say, negative 15. Real axis, so this is sigma, imaginary axis, so this is omega. We have a zero when s equals to negative 15 plus zero j. Does everybody, does everybody agree with me there? Is this clear? At when s equals to zero, uh, s equals to minus 15, this point, and omega is zero because we are along the zero axis, it's a zero for the transport for this function. So just for clarification purposes there, the variable that you've used to represent sigma is the uppercase letter of the sigma from before, or, or is that a different variable? I'm not sure. So it's the same variable. So real axis would be sigma, Imaginary axis omega, where s equals to sigma plus j omega. If I wrote this, no, that would be tau. Did I write something else before? Yeah, that's sigma. You, you wrote the sigma that's written now. Okay. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's that's the one. Okay. What else can you identify here? Where are the poles? Let's look at this one here. Where is that pole? S equals two at that point. Uh, minus 10. Minus no, 10. No, sorry. Um, zero plus, uh, no. Um, yeah, zero for, for sigma. Yeah. Zero. Minus 10. Minus 10. Minus 10 yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. And there's another one in the back there. What is that one? Is zero, this is along the same line, and it's plus 10. I see complex conjugate. So, yeah. uh, Professor, is that a J or? That's J, yeah. Okay. Right. One is the imaginary axis. We need to add J just to show that that's imaginary. Oh, but right here, you use the capital one. I mean, the, the J. Capital, yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Now we can create a function. What is the function? Let's call the function x of s. So what would be the function f, x of s? We need the function to go to zero when s approaches negative 15. So what should go on top of the equation? What should go on top of the equation? s minus minus 15 plus zero j. So when S, we replace S with S minus 15 plus J, the top of the equation goes to zero and the whole thing goes to zero. What about the, um, the bottom of the equation? What goes at the bottom? We want the, why is the bottom? Because now we want everything to go to infinity. So let's assume that, let's take this point here, this first pole. Uh, if you want the function to go to infinity when you approach that point, what should we write? 
it should be s minus uh, zero plus 10 j this is the first this one uh, i think is the negative one so it's s uh, yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah. i just uh, put them all outside the bracket so oh okay yeah right so i'm just going to use the brackets for clarity so it's minus 10 j 10 j and then i believe there's another part is the s plus uh, zero plus 10 j right And the other part corresponds to that other piece. Now, if see, you see when you approach in each of these points, the function either goes to infinity or goes to uh, zero. And if we keep solving this, this becomes s plus 15 divided by s squared plus 100. Uh, professor, uh, here yeah. I have a question. So the for the poor part, there should always be two part because yes. okay got it well the, the 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 bottom if we are using complex variable numbers if the bottom if the polar would work we only have one at the bottom because it would be a real number so you always have complex conjugates when you have complex it could even be in the numerator of the equation right? if we are if these points were zeros instead of poles it could go either way. It doesn't, it, the point is, it doesn't matter where, if they are the numerator or the denominator. What matters is, are these numbers complex, con, complex conjugates or are they real numbers? So when you wrote out the uh, numerator and denominator, you're writing them like without the equal sign or you're, you moved over the J term to the left side of the equation and then wrote it out, I'm like, or are they roots? Like how, I'm just a little bit confused as to how they you are, wrote. They are roots. They are, okay. Yeah. yeah. They are the roots. Um, sorry, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So this formula that we came up with, x of s equals s minus this, and then uh, the denominator, um, I can't find it on either the, formula sheet or the lecture yeah you will not find this in a, in a textbook you know, um, the textbook the textbook will just give you this equation and will give you the table uh, but we do need it right no we, we don't need to do this manually because this thing this has been tabled for us oh, when, okay, for example let's look at here sign of at sine of at if you take the laplace transform that is going to be a squared divided by s plus a squared what does it mean it means if you do the whole process in time domain create that big graph and you try to recreate the function using the formulation we just described we will get a divided by s squared plus a squared we don't need to go through the whole process the process has been done this is the result this is good enough but i want to present this to you because i don't want this to just be a looking at a table, looking at what the result is without understanding what that means. Right. The key message is that the Laplace transform is simply a combination of sinusoidal exponential waveforms to describe a signal from time domain and frequency domain. That's all. But it's important that you understand why we're using this, where, where this comes from. And from now on, we're, we're just going to apply it. We are not going to derive this every time. This, this is just one time explanation from now on, you use this table, all right? So let's further look at this table here. We have, for example, two important ones, sine and cosine. Sine of AT gives A squared, uh, A divided by e, S squared plus, uh, S squared plus A, A squared. Cosine gives S divided by S squared plus A squared. It's all done for us. Now let's go back to the lecture example. The equation we created here, is given there. We know that Laplace of cosine at is s divided by s squared plus a squared. So what is the inverse Laplace of this? Now we are here. What is the inverse Laplace? Compare them. If cosine of at is that, 
what is the inverse of s divided by s squared plus 100. We Sorry. have, well, we have, sorry, we have S on top, we have S on top, we have S squared, we have S squared, and you have A squared equals to 100. So the result is cosine 10. of 10. T. Cosine of 10. T. For the second part here, we have 15, it's a different one, this is going to be a sine. And let me give you the results. So if we had a sine, sine of omega t, or sine of a t, let's look at the table. What is sine of a t? Sine of a t is a divided by, is number seven, a divided by S squared plus A squared. So that is the portion there. We can rewrite this as 15 divided by 10 times 10 divided by S squared plus 100. So now we have A is 10, A squared is 100, so everything matches. This is 15 over 10 sine of 10 t. Right, so this is the signal in question. We'll do more of these, uh, a lot more of these examples. Okay, so here we have the, what we're going to find in the textbook, it starts here, it is equation four and equation five, forward Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform, and that's all. And this is now table. This manipulation is tabled in uh, what you saw before. Quickly, a few properties. Yeah. Sorry. Would you be able to explain where the 15 over 10 came from in the previous slide? Sure. So 15 still there. Is that a constant? Is that constant 15? You cannot get rid of it. But if you look at the formula, we need a a to appear on top. If you look at here, we need a on top and you need a squared there. All right, so a squared is 100. Right, a squared is 100, so a is 10. So we need to fabricate the 10 here. So if we have a 10 on top, we need 10 in the denominator. And this is just to match that uh, format. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. We'll do more examples as of time. So a few uh, properties to be aware of. Linear, uh, well, Laplace transform is linear. Uh, we have a final and in the initial value theorem they're going to use later where we can solve for the point where the system settles either in the time domain or in the frequency domain. And you don't need to go back and forth with them, between them. We're going to look at this specifically in lecture six. So here are some table values for the Laplace transform. This is the forward and the inverse. The impulse function is a step function. The Laplace transform is simply one. Step function, one over S. Exponential, one over S plus A, and so on. All these are tabled here also more. They are also tabled in the other um, examples. In, in, the in the table of Laplace transform. Two particular ones that I need you to pay attention for is the integration and the derivative, because they will always show up in differential equations. The Laplace variable itself represents a derivation. When you have d over dt of a variable, that will be replaced with s. And we have an integral that will be replaced with one over s. So these are the two main ones that are going to use when you take the Laplace transform of, of differential equations, they will always show the derivative and the integral. For the derivative, I will also need you to pay specific attention to initial conditions. Here is one example. The kth derivative is represented by the function of f of t. f of t becomes f of s, but now multiplied by s times to the power of k minus a bunch of elements that correspond to 
the initial conditions. For example, for the second derivative, the derivative, the Laplace transform of x double dot, k equals to 2, this will give s squared times x of s minus s times x zero minus x dot, if we apply here. What are these elements? x, s squared, and x of s, well, that's the Laplace transform. The other two are the initial conditions. x of zero means the initial position, if we are dealing with position, and x dot of zero, the initial speed of something, the derivative of position at time zero. Okay, let's do one example to clarify this. Here is one. Here is a electrical circuit. We know the equations for this electrical circuit. What is the Laplace transform of this? We have V of t equals to Ri plus L di dt. So what is the Laplace transform of all this? Let's see. V of t is a function, simply becomes V of s. R is a constant, it doesn't change, it becomes R. It stays R. I of t is a function of time, becomes a function of s. L is a constant, and di dt becomes, now I of t becomes I of s, and the derivative becomes s from the table from this operation here, right, with no initial conditions. Let's add for, just for the for an, another example, let's add a capacitor. If we add a capacitor here, we need to add a term that is one over C integral of I dt. How would that translate into the Laplace transform? One over C, I of S, one over c is a constant, i of t becomes i of s. And what happens to the integral? It becomes 1 over s. The property we saw there, equation 12. All right. So, Professor, could you go back to the last slide? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, for like what you wrote in the talk, um, you said if like you're giving like k equals to something, you just keep going down. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we just keep going down until you you reach uh, the exponential of zero for s. Well, let's do one example to clarify that a bit more. Uh, you can look at example one or exercise one. Let's just start here. Take a look at this one as I erase the, the board. And let's see. Uh, how many of you never saw Laplace transforms before? Just tell me on the chat there. I'm going to take a look at it. I'm pretty sure the biomed elect stream doesn't take the course that teaches you Laplace transforms. No, you do. You do. Take yeah, math 3705. We don't okay. take math 3705 if you start oh. in 2019. Yeah. True. Yeah, you don't. Uh, you don't take True. math 3705 anymore. Yeah, that's why. So, but you, you, you guys do have differential equations, right? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, yeah. Differential yeah. equations, yes, but not Laplace. Oh, that's that's good. Okay, we'll, we'll work, we'll find a solution. So this, in the syllabus for this course, uh, Laplace transform was as one of the prerequisites. So um, it's the assumption I was making, but that's okay, we'll, uh, we'll work our way through this. All right, so let's do this example here to clarify things a bit, or maybe to confuse you even further, let's see. So here we have an elastic model of a muscle that is represented, resented, represented, please correct that, 
represented by a mass and spring as shown. So there's no friction. If the muscle is released from rest when stretched by alpha units, calculate its position as a function of time. The mass is stretched, the muscle is stretched, and let go. What is the position as a function of time? So let's do let's do that. Let's see what do we do with all this nonsense. So here is the mass spring damper system. Let's see what we we get. So there are two pieces of information that are very important. The first one is that the mass is originally is stretched to a position alpha and released from rest. So what does that tell us? It tells us the initial conditions. The first one is at time zero, what is the displacement of the mass? At time zero, y of zero, position at time zero, what is the displacement of the mass? Um, zero. Alpha. This, alpha, exactly, alpha, right? Because we are stretching the spring to alpha and letting it go. When you let it go, that's time zero. So the initial displacement is indeed uh, alpha. What is the, origin, the, the initial speed? What is x? y dot at time zero. zero zero why zero because the problem says the muscle is released from rest so we stretch the spring we let it go from position alpha okay so this this is what you get from the, the problem how do you solve for the position y now? Well, I need to solve this differential equation, the creative differential equation, and solve for it. So let's just start with first things first, a block diagram. Let's assume that we are pulling the mass to the right, to position alpha, and letting it go. If you let it go at that position, what is the only force acting on the system? Is the spring force that is moving it back to the left. It's a stretch to the right, the spring will try to move this to the left. And what is the force here? K times X, oh, sorry, K times Y. K times Y. Yeah, all good? All good? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So let's assume that stuff moving that this way is positive. What is the equation of motion? Sum of all forces equals to m y double dot from lecture two. What do you have? Stuff moving that way is positive. We have negative k y. This force, and that's the only force in fact, and this is equal to m y double dot. So our equation of motion is very simple. Y m y double dot my plus k y is equal to zero. Okay, now let's take the Laplace transform of this to solve for y. What is the Laplace transform of a constant? Is a constant. So the Laplace transform of m is simply m. Laplace transform. What is the Laplace transform of the second derivative? I added here for quadrant. So we have here the function is f double dot, here we have y double dot. So f double dot of t becomes f of s times s times s squared minus the initial conditions, position times s minus original speed. So tell me what I put here. We are dealing with Laplace transform of y double dot. Tell me what the Laplace transform is for y double dot. Here is this from the table. This comes straight from the Laplace table. It would be s squared times s squared times yep. y s so, times y s yep. plus s times y derivative zero uh, minus right? minus oh, oops. minus yeah, yeah. minus, minus s times y zero. What is y zero? Is alpha initial position at time zero, yes. alpha, and minus f dot at zero, which is y dot at zero, initial speed, 
yeah. zero. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now, and this is plus k times y of t becomes now y of s. Are we good here? Any questions? So what is this again? This is S Y zero. Y zero is alpha. Uh, professor, could you please uh, explain why here the K Y, the Y equals to the Y S? Sorry, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay, my question is the 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 uh, equation y equals to the y s. Right. So y of t uh, becomes y of s. The variable that is y in time just becomes y of s. We are shifting time to frequency. That's oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no further questions here, now we can group terms that have y. So we have the first term here and the last term that has y. And this term doesn't have y, you can send it to the other side of the equation. So what we are left with? y of s, on this side we have ms squared plus k. And this is equal to whatever doesn't have s, don't forget the m multiple, doesn't have y, sorry, don't, don't forget the m here equals to m alpha. S. And just grouping terms. Now y of s is m alpha s divided by m s squared plus k. So this is the displacement of this mass given in the time in the frequency domain. What does that tell us again? It tells us what is the alpha, what is, what is the sigma, what is the omega, what is the exponential, what is the sinusoidal component needed to describe the behavior of y of t. How do find y of t now? Now we need to do the inverse Laplace transform. So take a look at the table and tell me which one you see as the closest function. Take a look at there. I'll pull up, pull up the table here. What is the closest approximation to what we have? Something with S on top, S squared in the denominator and A squared in the denominator, that is equation eight. That resembles a cosine waveform. Right? Resembles a cosine waveform, which I actually wrote here. Cosine of omega t equals to s divided by s squared plus omega squared. Now notice that this has s here multiplied by one. We have m here, so we need to first divide everything by m. And if we divide both the numerator and the denominator by m, what do we get? This m disappears. We have alpha s divided by s squared plus k over m. I just divided the top and the bottom of the equation by m. Why? Because this s and this s squared here, they don't have anything multiplying them. It's just one. So we need to get rid of that m there. What is y of t now? y of t is the inverse Laplace transform of y of s. Based on this, Tell me what uh, if we are good. So we have a constant. The constant we can write that in front of the equation. We can move that to the front. Let's put it here. So alpha becomes alpha. It's a constant. And here we have s on top, s is squared. We are all good. And we have omega is squared, which is k divided by m. So omega squared equals to k divided by n, omega is the square root of k over m. All right, so this is the omega we need now. So tell me now what is the result here? Alpha cos uh, square root of k over mt. Excellent. Square root of k over m all times t. What is this? This is y 
of t. That's the result of our equation. Now let's let's think about it. Does this make sense? Let's look at this equation. We stretch this mass, uh, this this muscle. We let it go, and according to this, we have a cosine waveform that never settles. So if we plot this, we have we're going to have something like the cosine of zero is one. So we're going to have something like that. Magnitude is alpha, and this never settles. It just oscillates. Does it make sense? Does it make sense physically to you? No, because there should be um, um, some friction usually. Uh -huh. Right. There should be, in reality, some friction. That, very good point. Where is friction here? We neglected it. We neglected it. So friction is absent. Which means that the energy only goes from kinetic energy from the mass to potential energy in the spring and back and forth. Nothing dissipates energy because the model does not account for friction. But you're right. Should the model have friction with a damper here or uh, friction there, this would not be would not be true. What would happen? A exponential component would appear. What would that exponential component do? Dissipate this energy and make this curve slowly decay to zero. Here is the sinusoidal component, and here would be the exponential component that would bring that to zero. This would show up if we had friction. Because friction is, no, is not there, this cannot exist. The mass oscillates back and forth indefinitely. Is in reality, it doesn't happen like that, but according to the model, this is precisely what we should get. Okay, so questions. Um, sorry, I just had one question. Why do we call it the inverse Laplace transform function? Right. So we did both. We did the forward. The forward was this this operation here. Now we went from time to s to frequency. That's the forward Laplace. And here we did the inverse when we went from s back to time. So only this oh, portion here, this portion here is the inverse. And from here to there is the forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Have you guys seen partial fraction decomposition so far? Please let me know in the chat if we did it. Partial fraction decomposition. Now let's say so a function like this, uh, a over s plus one, s plus two, this can be written as a constant over s plus one plus another constant over s plus two. Does this ring a bell? If if it does, if it doesn't, then let me know. I will have to modify some of my notes. Okay. Any questions? So given that you're quiet and you were not quiet in the past lectures, which was good, this probably tells me that this is not very clear. When the students don't have questions, there, there are two, so two possible explanations. They either understand everything, and everything is clear, everything is good, or they don't even know what to ask. I hope we are talking about the former case, but if it is the latter case, let me know and we can do more examples. So I'll take, are there any, any questions? Yeah, just a quick question. Will you be posting some Laplace transform resources on the uh, site so we can maybe do some examples and get familiar with them? Yeah, I will. I will, and I will try to introduce a few more examples in the next lecture as well. Great, yeah, thank you. That would be super helpful for uh, people who haven't done that uh, math course with Laplace. Okay, yeah, I, I need to bring this up to the department chair 
because this is a, a hole in the curriculum and we need to, need to fix that. Um, the, the, did question. this change recently? Excuse me, did that just change? So, uh, so if you so. started in 2019 um, in the Biomed Elect program, you didn't have to take 3705 oh, okay. in your third year. Yeah. So um, okay. any anyone so, below, so like 20, possibly 2020 and 2021 also won't be taking that course. I see. And you guys are in your third year, so that is, you're the first promotion in countering this issue. Yeah, we were the yeah. first year to yeah, not take exactly. it. And okay. the professor can tell you not only in this course is that from there's another one also they move the requirement for that math course. So okay. probably that could be a problem, not only your one. There's one is the system uh, 3203. That one previously is also asked for the uh, 3705, but right now they remove it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. I will try to post more and we'll, uh, I have a video that I recorded for from for a different course. I'm going to post that as well. And then uh, I'll try to find a, a chapter and textbook or something and give that to you. Uh, in, unfortunately, in controls, there is no way around. We need to use Laplace transform. The, the entire course is structured around that. But we'll, uh, you know, it's, it's not your fault. Uh, so I'll, I'll We'll, we'll try to accommodate that. So somebody had a question before. Yeah, I question. did. Uh, so for example, one, what part of the question indicated that we had to find the inverse Laplace transform? The question in the, that is in the statement that says calculate its position y of t as a function of time. Okay, so if whenever want... they ask us for the position, no, whenever he asks for functions of time. Okay. Functions of time. It could have been the speed as a function of time. Right? Whenever we want functions of time. Okay, thank you. Right. This is a lot easier, believe me, than solving uh, this using a regular differential equation. Uh, too. Any, any other questions? Time to start a new example. So what I'm going to do is uh, I will have some of them recorded. I'll post them and also post an, an additional lecture on this. I will reintroduce some of these concepts. No further questions? No? Okay, so uh, I have you had here one more example that I wanted to do, but we are out of time. So I will do the analytical, so put, put the solution on the slides and also give you the uh, video to that. Okay, and if you have any questions, they'll be available from now on. Uh, I think today I have two hours of office hours, if I'm correct. And I'll, there's a Zoom link posted that you can, uh, you can reach me there. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, everybody. And uh, don't worry, uh, we'll find a way through these Laplace transforms. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, sir. Bye. Good day.